Welcome back to the second video on trigonometric identities. If you're watching this video, you are either brave enough to learn more about trig identities or confused enough to need to learn more about trig identities. So that's what we're going to do in this video is just continue talking about trig identities. Um, I just have summarized the basic trig identities that we've used to solve trig problems or trig identity problems. Uh, again, I just want to remind you about these steps. Uh, I'm not going to go over these in detail, but feel free to pause and read these. I'm going to refer to these throughout uh, this tutorial. Okay, so I've started with just kind of a, you know, it looks complicated, but the solution's relatively simple, and I'll kind of escalate in difficulty as promised. Okay, so remember, the first thing we want to do is pick on the most complicated side. I would argue this left side is much more complicated than the right side, which is quite simply one. And we want to pick on anything that's not sine or cos. Okay, so I'm going to pick on this tan, and I'm going to write that as sine over cos. The rest of my expressions can stay the same. Uh, remember, I've just used the the quotient identity that tells me that tan is equal to sine over cos. And I, you can see here I'm multiplying cos x times sine over cos. This is cos is over 1, so I can cancel these guys out nicely. Uh, and then you're thinking, well, this one wasn't actually that bad at all because I'm left with sine over sine, which reduces to 1. <laughs> and that was actually a very simple identity. Uh, sorry, identity problem. Uh, but I am going to escalate the difficulty quite substantially, and you'll see that in just a moment. All right, so the second example, this one is a monster. Uh, I don't know which side you, you would call more complicated, um, but I, I'm going to say the left-hand side uh, just because you've got these weird, you know, rational expressions. Uh, so let's pick on the left-hand side. Looking at the left-hand side, there is no, you know, if we look back at our steps, that we can't write anything in terms of sine and cos because it's already done for us. We can't common factor. We're kind of stuck with finding a common denominator. This is going to be a messy one, finding a common denominator. Uh, but as it turns out, if you're comfortable finding common denominators for fractions, this one, it's not that complicated. Uh, to get a, a common denominator for this first term, the only way we can really do that is by multiplying by the denominator of the other term. And that's what I've done here is I've done 1 plus sine x over 1 plus sine x. And I've done the, uh, the, the conjugate for the other term. I've multiplied by 1 minus sine x over 1 minus sine x. Doing that will allow me to say, well, you know what, look at this, I've got a common denominator between these two terms. Now I can start adding these together. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, so I've multiplied 1 times 1 plus sine x, just to get the 1 plus sine x on top. Same thing over here, I've got 1 minus sine x on top. Now I've got common denominators, so I might as well combine these. When I do this, remember, you got to put that numerator in brackets. Right, because I'm subtracting more than one term here. So that is going to alter the sign of my expression. Uh, so you can see I've done that here. I've, I've distributed that negative into the brackets. So I've, I've got negative 1 now. I've got a negative times a negative to give me positive sign. Uh, let's just do a little bit of housekeeping here and clean up our expression. You can see I've got 1 minus 1. Those guys are going to cancel out nicely. Uh, let's just simplify the top by saying I've got two sine x's. And why not foil the bottom and call that 1 minus sine squared x. Okay, great. So we've definitely simplified the left-hand side compared to what we started with. But this would be a situation where you might find yourself thinking, I have no idea where this is going. And that happens in these trig identity problems. You'll often get to a position where you're like, well, great, this is not going anywhere. And you might even erase all your work and start over. Do not erase this work. You are on the right track, I promise. Remember that if you, if you ever see 1 minus sine squared x, that's kind of a hint to work with this Pythagorean identity. If you brought sine squared over to the other side, you'd have 1 minus sine squared, and that would tell you that you've got cos squared. So why not just make that substitution? Why not just say on the bottom, I've got cos squared? And then you're thinking, well, <laughs> that didn't do anything at all, except for the fact that we're, we're getting closer because now we have a cos on the bottom instead of a sine, and that's what we want on the right-hand side. Uh, and this is really, you know, this is one of those little tricks that I was talking about earlier, the, the fifth step in my, 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 my tips here. Every once in a while, you'll come across a trick that works. In this case, you know, this might not be intuitive, but we know that cos squared x, this is the same as cos times cos, right? That's cos x squared. So I'm going to write it this way, and you're thinking, well, why are you doing that? The reason for that is if you take a look here, I've got a sine x over a cos x, and I know that sine x over cos x is tan x. So if I write this sine x over cos x, if I just rewrite this as tan x, I happen to have the exact same thing that I have on the right-hand side. So I can conclude that the left-hand side does, in fact, equal the right-hand side. 
that was a messy trig identity problem. Uh, but you know, <laughs> you're gonna have to kind of get used to seeing things like this. But really, what this boils down to is just you know finding a common denominator, you know, simplifying, applying that that Pythagorean identity, and then just doing a little bit of um, creative, uh, you know, rewriting of that sine x over cos x. All right, so two more problems here. If you feel like you've got the hang of this one, um, you know, feel free to stop watching. These ones are definitely a little bit more involved as well. So, you know, just a little disclaimer here. The difficulty is a little bit, um, the difficulty is increasing compared to this first example. Uh, but let's dig into this one. So the left-hand side here, I would say, is, is not too complicated. Um, the right-hand side, anytime you have subtraction, you know, usually you kind of have a messier situation because you usually have to find a common denominator. So let's start there. Let's look at this guy. Uh, so we've got secant x minus cos x. We're going to start by writing that secant x in terms of sine and cos, which in this case is 1 over cos. I'm still subtracting a cos here. Uh, right away, when I see something like this, I, I'm thinking, okay, I've got a fraction and I'm subtracting something. Remember, this is a cos x over 1, so I'm really just subtracting two fractions here. So what I'm going to do is find a common denominator between these two. I do that by multiplying this uh, this term here by cos x over cos x. Why not simplify this a little bit by multiplying straight across, turn this into one over cos x minus cos squared x over cos. All right, so that's great. I've got a common denominator, so I could just combine my two terms here, turn this into one minus cos squared over cos x. And you can see I've already kind of skipped a step because uh, I don't know, if you're watching this, you might feel comfortable with this Pythagorean identity but I can, I can turn one minus cos squared x into sine x. And if you're, if you're scratching your head a little bit, just remember this, this Pythagorean identity, you can rearrange this thing at will, at, at your leisure. Uh, so that's where I've got this, this expression here from. So I've got sine squared x on top, cos on the bottom. You're thinking there's no way you can make this equal to sine x times tan x. However, just recall that I can write sine squared x as sine x times sine x. And when I do that, you can see I can take this guy and write it as a tan x, right? So I've made left side equal to right side. I've shown that this, uh, that this is a solvable trig identity problem. Okay, this one's very interesting. We've got, uh, you know, exponents of four. We haven't really looked at those yet, uh, but this is going to be a good one. Um, definitely complicated left-hand side. Let's pick on this one. So thinking back to factoring strategies, which is probably the last thing that's on your mind when you're doing trig identities, uh, you can see that this is a difference of squares. Maybe it doesn't immediately pop out, but you could take the square root of both of these terms and you, it's separated by a difference. So recall that this is a difference of squares. So if we were to factor this using difference of squares, we could just write our new expression in this way. I'm not gonna go over this in immense detail, but if you'd like to see a little bit of difference of squares factoring, feel free to check out the video lesson that I did on difference of squares factoring and then jump back in and see if you can follow this a little bit better. Okay, so this is great. Uh, I've, I've factored this using difference of squares factoring and you can see here I've got a nice little Pythagorean identity. This is one of the nicest things about uh, these sorts of problems is when you come across a Pythagorean identity, it just feels so good to rewrite this as one. So that thing is really just gone. We don't even need that in, in our solution anymore. Uh, so we're left with this kind of messy little expression. A lot of people are tempted to say, oh, well, this is equal to one. That's the Pythagorean identity. But remember, the Pythagorean identity is for addition of sine and cos squared. So we're not going to be able to do that in this case. However, let's look at what we need. On the right-hand side, we need one minus two sine squared x. So it'd be nice if we could somehow turn this into a one, and then we'd almost be there. We've already got one sine squared x. We just need another sine squared x. And it turns out that the solution lies in the Pythagorean identity again. If I bring the sine squared over to the other side, I've got one minus sine squared, that is cos squared. So why not make that substitution? Why not call cos squared x one minus sine squared x? So that's what I'm gonna do. I've just changed my cos squared x into this one minus sine squared x. Okay, well now I've got a situation where I can collect like terms. So I move my screen around. I can collect my like terms here. These two sine x squareds are like terms. So I've got two sine squared x's. Now I can just say that I've got one minus two sine squared x. So I've proved that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. Uh, it looked very, very difficult at first. Maybe it wasn't as difficult as I made it out to be. 
Uh, you know, I think these are definitely more difficult than the examples that I did in the previous video tutorial. This one definitely was more complicated. Um, if you're looking for more complicated trig identities, you know, you can really just Google uh, trigonometric identities. If you're in grade 11 functions in, uh, in, uh, in Ontario, in Ontario, you will certainly see some more complicated trig identity problems. Okay, so you made it through trig identities. That's great. I'm hoping you're feeling a little bit more confident with these. Like I said, these are arguably one of the more challenging things that you'll see in secondary mathematics. So I'm hoping that this uh, these video tutorials have helped.